Hello, I'm Mark Kermode. I'm very pleased to be joined by the writer and director of Bait, Mark Jenkin. Mark, hello. Hello. So we're going to do a commentary, uh, talk about the film as it plays. Whilst the titles are on, just tell us a little bit about the background of where Bait came from. Uh, well, this is a film that has been in gestation for a long time. I wrote the original draft of it in 1999, or had the original idea then. First first real draft was 2002, so it's a project that's developed for many years. Um, it was originally a found footage video diary film and has turned into something very different. I mean, it wasn't. I wasn't trying to get it made for that entire time. It was put on the shelf several times. Who's the guy that we've just seen walking along? So that is Edward Rowe, uh, known in Cornwall as Kerno King, which is he's a stand-up comic. I suppose is the the way he's best known back at home. Um, but also a, a, a quite experienced theatre actor as well. Um, but yeah, Kerno King for for a lot of people. But through the sort of success of the film, I think he's he's been moving away from that persona a little bit. And where are we here? Um, this is uh, Charlestown. So this is harbour on the south coast of Cornwall, which is, this is the outer harbour. There's two harbours there. There's an inner harbour, which is quite often used as uh, a location for period drama, things like Poldark, and all the way back to things like um, The Eagle Has Landed. It's filmed there in the inner harbour, and we're in the outer harbour. Um, that boat's the Buccaneer which is uh, a working fishing boat from Evergizzy, skipper, a guy called Johnny Collings. And, uh, yeah, he just sailed it round the bend from Evergizzy for us to use for a couple of days. So you said um, gestation for the best part of two decades, and you said it began as a found footage diary? Yeah, the idea was that it was about a fisherman who picked up a video camera and um, decided to make a, a film about his way of life. And he borrowed a video camera off somebody in the village and started filming his life. And as he filmed it, he realised that the way of life that he thought he was living was maybe in danger or it didn't even exist in the way that he thought it existed anymore. And so the film was going to be effectively two unedited mini-DV tapes of this, of his kind of uh, inquiry into the state of his his village and his descent into sort of violence, effectively. And if you were first thinking of this in 99, so that's immediately post-Blair Witch. Is that where that came from? No, it was pre-Blair Witch. 99 is post-Blair Witch, Mark. <clears throat> the idea I had then was before. I actually saw a... I had the idea for it, and then I saw a film called The Last Broadcast. Oh, yeah, which, which is pre-Blair Witch. Yeah, yeah, and I met the... I went to... Um, Lux when it was in Hoxton Square, the cinema there. Oh wow! And they and the filmmakers were there, and I met them. And um, I think that the whole thing with Blair, which was blowing up there, I don't think it was out over here, but um, certainly everybody was talking about Blair Witch Project and not about the last broadcast. No, in fact, because the last broadcast actually generally only got seen in the wake of the Blair Witch Project as the film that had come beforehand. I remember reviewing it for Sight and Sound when it came out. Right. Yeah, I mean, we watched it from... It was being beamed over from some small room in in the middle of America somewhere. Wow. And there was a satellite dish on the top of um, the Lux building in God, what is that? Square. How, how amazing, because so few people saw that film. Yeah, I really I really loved that film. Yeah, it's very yeah. interesting. It very, is. very interesting. It, I think it unravels a little bit towards the end, but I did... It, I, it, it was very creepy, I thought. Okay. So, obviously, the key for that is it would be video. This is not shot on video. This is all shot on... Well, tell us what it's shot on. This is shot on 16mm. So, it's shot on a, on a clockwork Bolex, black and white negative, um, all hand-processed by myself in my studio, and um, all shot silently and all post-synced in terms of the sound. And that's something that you'd done before in short films or yeah. shorter films? Yeah, I'd done it in short films... Um, all, uh, for years I've been making Super 8 films um, and when the Super 8 lab started to close down I started to process the film myself and then from there I started shooting 16mm and mostly experimental, non-narrative stuff mm -hmm. but then I made a film in 2014, I think 2015 called Bronco's House which was made in exactly the same way that Bates made and it was, I sort of say it as a dry run for Bates but it, it wasn't really, I wasn't really thinking of of making bait in this way at that time but once I'd made Bronco's house and I felt it worked and I'd loved the process of doing it and I'd uh, I'd kind of taken the risk with Bronco's house because everybody said you're mad to try and shoot an, a narrative yeah. film on a hand wound Bolex hand process the negative and then post sync it all the most common response was 
why? <laughs> <laughs> and my response was always, because it's fun. And you've got you've to have fun when you're making films, because else it's a nightmare. So, yeah, Broncos House... I was happy with the results. It was, it was a 44-minute long film, so it was it was so uncommercial in terms of its length. So it didn't get screened a lot. Yeah, we in it, in it, it's, it didn't. We didn't even submit it to a lot of festivals because a lot of the festivals were saying short films was anything under 40 minutes and feature films was anything over 45 minutes. And we had a 44-minute long film, so, <laughs> so you it deliberately didn't... made it in the, exactly the wrong <laughs> yeah. length. So it technically didn't even exist once we'd made it. <laughs> but but the response to it was really great you know it wasn't a huge response but it was the response that i was hoping it was the response it was people seemed to feel about the film the way i felt about it so mm -hmm. i i thought let's let's take this very developed script that i already had and see if the theme and the heart of the script could stand a complete change of form and in some ways it's totally different to the original video handheld video diary style film but in other ways it's very similar because it's it's putting form at the forefront. Yeah. It's a different form, but it's still all about form. Um, we'll, we'll come back to them. Tell us who it is that we're seeing, the, 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 the new characters that are arriving here. Okay, so we've got... That's Mary Woodvine, who um, is my partner, a uh, very experienced theatre and TV actor. And just say that's Lynn Waite, who's one of the actual producers of the film in a little cameo. Everybody, in, everybody involved in the crew... Everybody did everything. ...is in it, yeah, sometimes more than once. Um, yeah, so that's the... the that's, um, Mary, my partner, who plays the uh, plays Sandra, who owns the um, the holiday home on the quay. And this is very significant because they're turning up with all the produce that they've brought from somewhere else. And this is something that this is explicitly referred to later on. But it's yeah. this idea about people coming into Cornwall, but and they say, "Oh well, you know, we benefit the local industry." So, no, you don't. You bring everything with you. Yeah, and actually, that was a reshoot. And I should give credit to um, Kate Byers. Um, and Lynn, Lynn Waite, who that was a, a, a reshoot that was suggested that the placing the bags on the table like that wasn't explicitly in the original edit of the film, right. but we did shoot an extra roll and it was stocking the fridge, um, which we'll see in a minute with yeah. all of that produce, but also the bags being put onto the table. Here's, here's the fridge sequence. Originally, there is a cut of this film where um, Tim, uh, Sandra's husband just opens the fridge and puts one bottle of wine in right. and it was very much from the male point of view where all he cared about was he was on holiday he just wanted <laughs> to, to cool down the white wine so he could have a glass of wine but actually we switched it so that it was she was stocking the fridge so it was a sort of maternal domestic scene yeah. which was very familiar to everybody but it did have this little undercurrent that could be called back to later on. Because what they're sticking in is Prosecco and, and fancy produce. And yeah, leisure food. Leisure food. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so who else are we seeing? OK, yeah, so um, we've just... Uh, this is um, Isaac Woodvine, who is Mary, who we've just seen. That's actually Mary's son. And Georgia Ellery. Georgia, who is um, a fantastic musician. Um, as well as an actor who is in a band called Jockstrap, Maybe. which I, I think are on the verge of big things. Um, Isaac is, uh, yeah, like I say, Mary, my partner's son. He was, for a, for a long time, been um, lined up to play that role, really. And how would you, how did you go about casting this? I mean, you, you, it's a very sort of uh, magpie-ish-like casting, isn't it? You see somebody, you like something about them, and you get them involved. Tell me about that. Yeah, well, it's, it's to do with... Um, aesthetics for me the way people look because because i post sync everything the actual dialogue is not recorded until the film's been made so it's very important to me the way people look and the way people move so quite often i will i will cast on on that basis and then i'll I'll meet the people and chat to them and make sure they've got an understanding of what they can, how they can portray the character. But it, it sounds really shallow, but I do sort of, yeah, judge books by their covers. <laughs> but I mean, you know, somebody like Isaac has got um, such a fantastic look. Oh, and this, this, the older guy here is Martin Ellis, who's known as Nutty Noah. Um, back home, he's a, he's a very famous uh, fisherman down on the lizard. He doesn't fish anymore, but he, he's the person who I cast very early on, you right. know, probably 15 years ago, I met him in open casting. I already knew of him, but he came into an open casting and um, the casting director we had on board at the time then just said to me as soon as he walked out after I'd done a bit of hot seating with him, just said, that's, that's the, that's that's the, the man. And he sort of acted as the, as the fishing consultant 
on the film as well. You are passionate about fishing, the craft of fishing, the history of fishing. You want to say something about that? Yeah. I mean, I've grown up around it, and I love it. I don't think there's anything else quite like it. The community, the fishing community, I think, is unique. The work is unique because you can modernise the work to a certain extent. You can sort of modernise the job and streamline the job, but ultimately people have to go to sea and uh, and do that physical work in the way that they've always done it. You know, you put you put bait effectively in the water and you try and pull out fish. And I think, so in some ways, the fishing industry is timeless and some could argue it's stuck in the past, but I would say it's it's got a sort of purity and honesty to it. And, and also, I think the fishing industry is always misrepresented. Fishing communities, fishermen are always simplified. And then the most... On film. Yeah. Well, in, yeah, in, in, all, in all media, and they're often used in as pawns in other people's games, but they... The idea that as a stereotypical fisherman, for me, is the thing that I just find is is laughable. I mean, you know, the character Ed plays here is certain tropes, certain sort of uh, certain type of archetype. But fish, the fishing people are, are so... They're individuals, you know, the most um, extreme people... I think, uh, you know... Extreme... In well, it's sort of um, indivi just individuals, you know, free thinkers, the real free thinkers, because they're people who live entirely in the moment and they live, uh, I mean, less less so now, but kind of outside of the rules and the norms, yeah. you know, life on a boat, especially if you're, if you're deep sea fishing, every, all the rules go out the window. It's about surviving and relying on each other and i just think there's a there's a kind of freedom to that and a strength in the community that i've never really seen on on film is it something you've done yourself no 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 not that i've done commercially but i mean i you know i i fished with um with friends of mine like my mate nick dark the cornish playwright who's, who's a big influence on me he's no longer with us but he was a sort of mentor yeah, yeah yeah definitely and he most of the fishing processes you see in the film is, is stuff that i would have that their fishing processes that he did right. that i helped him with from time to time and sort of learned how to do from him so mm. shooting the bass net on the beach shooting the lobster pot from the ring bolt in the gully all of that is sort of stuff that i've i've seen firsthand and done and done with him and and, and with others subsequently Describe the couple for us okay so mary woodvine playing sandra and simon shepherd playing tim so um it's funny everybody always says they're from london in you know people write about the film but i've never said where they're from but <laughs> apparently they're londoners apparently. um and they bought this uh yeah they bought this house um as a bit of a getaway um i imagine I imagine for for him, it's for the stress to get away from the stress of whatever his job is, and for for her, it serves as a as a business that she runs. Now the kids are old enough, and she's probably been. That's is this is a key line when he said when she says you don't have you didn't have to sell us the house, and he says didn't I? That's kind of that's become one of the the the, the most memorable lines of the film. That's the key line in the film for me. Because it does... The, the thing is, when you talk about um, second home ownership, um, holiday homes, everything like that, and, and the housing stock moving from local people to incomers and, and how problematic that is, yeah. there's a very easy argument for people to say, well, who sold those houses? And it's absolutely right. You know, a lot of it is sold by yeah, local people selling the house to people moving into the area who might not be using those houses. So that's absolutely right. But I, what I wanted to highlight was the complexity of it and for him to ask a question at that point yeah. and say, you know, the, the backstory for me in that scene is that the two brothers have been left that house when the parents have died. So what do they do? They're not going to live in that house together, so they sell the house. And because the market decides, they sell the house to the highest bidder and then they both buy their own houses up the road. So, I mean... You know, for that for that line, I think he sent it to himself as much as as to her. I think, yeah. it's, you know, and and that's the point of the film. For pardon the pun, it's not supposed to be black and white. It's supposed to be, <laughs> you know, it's the drama should be in the grey areas. I think. Where's the pub that it's shot in? It's the Admiral Bembo in Penzance, upstairs in the in the Admiral Bembo, which is um, a local, quite a local pub to me. Quite a, not, I was going to say notorious, not a notorious pub, but everybody knows of the Admiral Bembo. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's full of um, full of uh, 
stuff, well, maritime stuff, a lot of stuff salvaged off um, off wrecks. Um, so a lot of people know of the Admiral Benbow. But, it's, yeah, it's, it's upstairs in the Benbow. And here is um, Senan. So this is a, up the top at Senan as a um, housing estate. Um, that's Chloe Endeen, who's a fantastic uh, local actor who um, I discovered through my good friend uh, Simon Harvey, who's a producer and a, a theatre producer and director, who um, also runs a work, an acting workshop in, in Truro, and she came through that workshop, and she was uh, on the cast list v very early, once I'd seen her in a, in, in a short film that she'd been in. It is a brilliantly cast film. I mean, it's, you know, every face stands out and you know every character from watching them move. Do you want to say something about the post-syncing process, just in case people don't understand what that involves? You shoot the film completely silently. You don't record sound on set. Yeah, no sound recorded. So they're obviously saying the, saying the words and their mouths are moving in the correct way, as you can see here. But all of the dialogue that they were saying at this moment when the pictures were were recorded is just lost in the wind um, and what I have once I've processed a negative is silent footage um, which I do an edit based on just lip reading what they're saying. I just you quickly said that's the gag about I mean, it's been modernised but it's got all this stuff over it that makes it look like, like a dirt. I've yeah, got a sex dungeon. A sex dungeon yeah. <laughs> when, Sorry. when I've been screening this film at festivals and the previews up until the film got released in the cinema I was that, that that's the, this is the moment I stay in the cinema until so I'll watch the first 17 minutes or whatever it is. Okay. And then I'll know how the Q&A will be afterwards based on how much of a laugh that line gets. Oh, really? <laughs> and I know I'm safe, you know. So if there's, if there's a bit of a murmur of laughter, I'll, I'll think, right, when I go and do the q and I've got to okay. tone it down a little bit. Not everybody's on board with this film, but, but there's been times, there was a screening in Falmouth that we did pre-release where there was so much laughter at that line that I, people were like missing the next scene, <laughs> <laughs> which kind of then irritated me. It's like, yes, laugh, but don't laugh that much. Well, you and I did a Q and A in New Lynn, yeah. and uh, and we could have. Ca I mean, the audience questions could have carried on for two hours afterwards. And even before that, when you were you couldn't be more home territory than that. You were nervous beforehand. You were, it's like every time you were nervous that. It, and you said to me that you were more nervous about watching it play in Cornwall than anywhere else because you said this the audience actually know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The it, as, as I said it before. The, it's very. I don't mind whether people like the film or not because there's so many variables whether people are like it, you know, even down to whether the, you know, whether somebody in the audience is hungry or not or has just had an argument yeah. with their husband or wife or whatever, you know, that's going to affect how people enjoy the film. So there's no control over That's it. an archetypal shot that was used for the, I think, one of the advertising images. That, beautiful, yeah. beautiful shot. That's lit by my very good friend Colin Holt, um, which, who worked absolute wonders on this film. We had three, we had three lamps and a reflector and we lit pretty much every shot, even the exterior. So this is very low light um, at dawn. Um, it's just gorgeous. Yeah, and so the backlight is the sun, and then there's a kind of fill light, which actually doesn't make any sense if you really look at it, because the fill light's coming from the other direction. <laughs> but I love I loved the artifice of cinema. The mate, you know, you, you, it's so artificial that it looks realistic. Is there a, a particular significance in this, in the tangled, in the gills tangled in the... I, yeah, it, it's just uh, what I'm trying to say in this scene is that these things that um, a fisherman makes look so easy are actually really difficult. You know, these are things, these are things that have to be learned through repetition over and over again. And so that's why at the end of this scene where the character of Martin gives him a little smile and say, you know, that's your first step. You can, you can get these bass out of the net without tearing the net or tearing the... <laughs> tearing the bass too yeah, badly. Yeah. And he recognises it as well, Neil, this character, didn't he? You know, he's a fisherman now because he's just taken... He's he's taken the fish out of the net. And so this final shot here, bang, that's his fish. You know, that's the one he did. And then, in contrast, you've got... And this is... Um, <laughs> the, the, I mean, quite often that, that shot gets a laugh, that reveal. <laughs> but that, um, <laughs> Joan Jacobs, who... Um, also a Cornish actor... You know, he's one of, the more, one of the more Cornish people in the film, but playing one of the uh, the non-Cornish characters. And again, that was, I saw him in a couple of theatre pieces and um, 
he's just got such a great face. There it is. And uh, just, uh, just, uh, I thought he could play with that character yeah. really well because he can be quite unlikable, but because of his age, I think you kind of forgive him and get a sense that he's going to learn from this experiences that he, he goes through in this film. So he, I kind of felt I could push him a bit further in terms of being a bit of an idiot. Well, one of the things you said that you, you didn't want to do was to, was to caricature anybody because you, you said if it, if it was just simply that the incomers are laughable and dislikable, then you'll lose half the, the dramatic punch. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it just becomes a bit brainless. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think... The idea of these characters is that they're a family and they're trying to do what they think is right, you know, and they're, a, they're quite a loving family. They're quite dysfunctional, like most families are, <laughs> but they but they sort of rub along and um, they've, they're they kind of a group, but they're also individuals and they've got their own idiosyncrasies. But ultimately, they've come to this place because they think they love this place and, you know, they do obviously get something out of it. Yeah. And um, their intentions aren't bad. They're just coming from a different angle than thirty quid character like Martin is. This is um, Stacey Guthrie here, who's a brilliant um, Cornish artist, really good friend of mine. Um, and again, she was somebody who was quite early on the cast list, and she was a little bit unsure about whether she was going to do it or not. But um, she took the leap, and I think is. Um, it's brilliant. I think I, I love that character because that's this as as the film um, uh, continues. You know, her she's quite a, con, a, 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 a conflicted character in yeah. a lot of ways because she is a local, but she's working in the tourist trade. But she's also got this link to um, still very much the community. I imagine she was probably at school with Martin or Martin's older brother Stephen. So yeah. she's part of this gang. So you've got her life here at the back door of the pub which is one thing, but then her life serving at the bar, which is something else. So that was very... Um, this this here is um, the lady with the baby, May, that's May Vug, who is actually Mary's niece, and that's her baby and her partner, Morgan. Um, and May's also the production designer on the film. And actually, the baby there is Ennis. Um, and when they walk out the front of the house, yeah. that was second day of the shoot, and he was a few months old, this scene here, when they get back on the back, yeah. was shot a month later. So he's actually... Complete he's, like, he's about 20% <laughs> older in terms of his life. Yep. Some so I think there's, um, you know, there are a few continuity errors in the film, but his age is one of them. Thank you. Now, one of the things that you'll notice as you're watching the film is that there are there are grains and flashes. We saw at the end of one reel, you know, we get a kind of a, a light flash. And you said that, that at some point, some somebody had said, oh, it's, you know, has he has he done that stuff digitally? And you said, no, This everything that you see in terms of the scratches, the imperfections, they are absolutely natural imperfections. Yeah. And it's my, as I've said to people before, who've said, oh, I like the way you added all the scratches in. Some people think it's done with After Effects, yeah. and I don't even talk to them. <laughs> some people think that I've done it deliberately in the processing, yeah. which I can understand, but then I have to tell them, no, this is my very best attempt to process a clean negative. This role here, I clearly was wearing a woolly jumper when I processed this role because you can see... Oh, that's what gives you the... Clothes, you can see clothes fibres there. Wow. These ones, that, that's, that's off a jumper. It's got to be. There's a scene later on that I'll point out where there's pollen on the emulsion, which is when I left the film to dry in the studio and I think I left the door or the window a little bit open and pollen came in and dried on the emulsion. And when that happens, do you see it as a happy accident? As long as I know why it happened, I love it. If I don't know why it happened, it drives me mad. I didn't know what the pollen was for a long time, and I hated it. And then as soon as I realised it was pollen, I was like, oh, it's brilliant. I love it. And then, I, and then I've done it again since. You are quite um, uh, particular, aren't you? You're, 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 no, I mean, I don't, I mean I'm, I'm saying this politely, but you are. You're, you're, you're a stickler for detail. Yeah, I am. And, but sometimes I'm really not as well sometimes i'm what's the word quite um shoddy at times as well and in fact um there's a name drop coming here but my friend andrew cotting describes himself as a shoddiest and he said to me i'm he, he called he said you're a fellow shoddiest and i think it sometimes embrace um I, I think i am a control freak but if I, I use shoddiness in a controlled way i'll let things be a bit ramshackled but uh, there's the uh, pollen 
Oh, that was it. That's pollen. Look at that. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's just because, a one roll. And it's because you left a door or a window open and the pollen came in from outside? Yeah, I was trying to process five rolls a day during the week. And then at the weekend, if I had a spare few hours, I would go and maybe do one roll to try and get ahead for the, for the next week. And I think I'd just done one roll and it was a weekend and I, I was probably sat out in the sun at the studio, sat out in the sun, and um, the pollen came in. That's how, I, that's how I think. And just so everyone understands this, you hand process the reels of film yourself in your studio in Newlyn. Yes. Yeah, five, five kilometres worth um, in a small rewind tank, 100 feet at a time, mixing feet and kilometres there, but um, it was 128 rolls, and I could do five a day at the very most, but that would be a sort of maybe 14, 15 hour day to do five rolls. And you would never farm it out, you have to do it yourself. Yeah, I can't understand people who let the lab have the fun. <laughs> I mean, having said that, then I have I have let the let the lab, I have, <laughs> we have paid the lab to do processing <laughs> sometimes. But I do, you know, for this film, it was always going to be part of the process. I knew that when we wrapped the shoot, the work had only just begun for me. Obviously, everybody working on the shoot had put in a yeah. huge amount of work, but for me, the work was just about to, be get, to begin. One of the joys when you were making it was you used to post these um, pictures of the crates with the film, with all the reels of film. And it, I mean, I remember because I, you and I had, had met before you made this and I'd seen Bronco's house and you said you were doing a feature and I, d I said, as everybody else did, yeah, good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> and it was seeing the, the reels of film amassing was astonishing yeah yeah and during the processing it was great because each time i processed a roll i would i would recan it and then put a different color camera tape on it and that was fantastic because it just i could see this box of film changing from silver which was the color of the tape from the yeah. shoe to sort of orange and green and the more orange and green it got the more the closer i was to <laughs> finishing this role, the, the, that part of the process, I mean. This is, I was just going to say that in, in this scene, we didn't switch off some of the fluorescent um, tubes in here. And so there's an amazing, it might be the scene before actually in the pub, but there's an amazing flicker that I think, we, on the new film, I think I'm actually going to use some fluorescent tubes in the lighting. I'm speaking to Colin about it at the moment. Because in case people don't know, fluorescent lighting flickers in a way that's captured on film. Yeah, yeah. and I, can, I think I can see it as well. Oh, I really? don't, fluor, Yeah, I think the, fl the flicker of fluorescent light kind of drives me mad, which uh, I always notice it in supermarkets. I always get a bit panicky in supermarkets, and I'm sure it's to do with the... Um... Well, everybody gets panicky in supermarkets. <laughs> it has nothing to do with so the lighting. So you can't see the flicker? <laughs> no, I still get panicky in supermarkets, but it's... Right. Oh, know, OK. But it is, it's definitely that it is something that is captured on film. And in fact, if you have an old, um, an old, uh, you know, Super 8 camera, yeah. it, you notice it on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and if it's totally in sync, you could shoot, you know, you could, your whole roll could come out black. Black, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this is... Um, this is a really key scene as well. In fact, when my sister Susanna saw this at the Newlyn screening that you were at, this was the bit. This was the the, the bit that she pointed out in the in the Q and A has been the bit that really reminded her of growing up. These beach parties that yeah. we'd have, like growing up on the north coast of Cornwall, where you in the summer you'd, you'd go, you'd follow the the flames down to where this party was on your beach and sit yeah. down, and then you see people's faces lit by the flames you look around and realize oh i don't know anybody here this is my beach but i don't know anybody here but everybody there does know each other and so that was this is a key moment where the character of um of neil here just sort of gets up and leaves because he's um you know he's he's the sort of minority here so this is something that has a particular resonance for you it does and it wasn't really until i mean it must have done when i wrote it but i'd kind of forgotten about how key this is but several people I knew you know like my sister obviously and, and old friends of mine pointed out this scene being very resonant and it, it took it took them to point out to me to sort of to, to, to kind of point out its significance do you feel very protective of Cornwall um, in some ways but it, it, it protective is a, is a weird it's a weird thing these days, isn't it? Because I, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to promote the idea that Cornwall shouldn't change and it should just be Cornish people, and you know, because you get into very dangerous territory, um, and and a, and a territory that I despise. Um, what I'm quite protective of is the way it's 
portrayed because mm. I think it's got an identity crisis and a lot of that is through its portrayal on film and television. Yeah. Um, but for me, Cornwall is is ever changing. It's, it's evolving. It's always been a place that has had... Its links have always gone outwards. You know, it's it, the, it had links all over the world long before it had well, a Cornish road. miners went everywhere else and took their took their trade out into the world. Yeah, exactly. And they bought the stuff back, you know. That's why we have saffron and saffron buns and ginger and ginger biscuits and I once asked you about whether you 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 felt, you know, Cornish identity is being profound and you said that you never felt more Cornish till you went away. And you said it was going away was the thing that made you have that 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 feeling of identity. Yeah, I spent up until I was about 19 um, I was in Cornwall, and as I as I got older, you know, as I as I was 17, 18, 19, I was desperate to get away and find out where where the party was because I didn't feel it was in Cornwall. <laughs> and then, as soon as I was out of Cornwall, I realised no, actually, the party is in Cornwall. I've just left the party. And, but then, by then, I, I'd gone through college, and I was I, I was in London working, and then as a as an adult who who needs money and is trying to carve out a career I then felt oh my god I'm stranded I've, I've exiled myself I can't how, how can I get back to Cornwall and, and live and work in Cornwall but certainly when I was in college in Bournemouth I I was the most Cornish person in the world yeah, I would I would <laughs> literally play a CD of Cornish male voice choir songs while we were in a student house drinking ready to go out you know and I wouldn't leave until we'd played Trelawney and sung all three verses of it and I'm sure people must have thought I was a total dick, but that was me expressing my yeah. my Cornishness, which is sort of, sort of a bit tragic in you know in very real sense. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and now I'm back in Cornwall, I think I'm a bit more relaxed yeah. about it. There's more here again of just it's just it, it's incidental detail of the craftsmanship of what's involved. Yeah, yeah. I mean this you know this net mending, the close up actually that you saw at the beginning of this yeah. is is not. Ed's hands, because Ed's got very, um, oh, he'll be listening to this. He's got, um, <laughs> what I always say he's got hands of a concert pianist. He it, it doesn't look like he's got fisherman's hands. So um, Joe Gray, who's the props master, he's got he's got great working hands. So quite often it's his hands who, who plays Martin's hands in the close-ups. Yeah. And actually here, where we see Martin... Um, tie the knot yeah. for the um, for the ring bolt. That's actually Nutty Noah. That's Martin Ellis, okay. the older fisherman's hands, um, because he needed to know how to tie that knot and look like he knew what he was doing as he was tying it. The scene here, and my worry was that through the viewfinder of the Bolex, you can't see a lot. So that looks when I was filming it, that's, it looks like a ring bolt, a rope, and a generic pair of hands. But I thought once it's processed and and it's up on the screen, people might notice it. It's an old pair of hands. So I, I had, sorry, Martin, an older pair of hands. So I had, um, I had the story already, it, it already in my head that the hands in this scene represent the timelessness. It's all the fishermen down the ages that are tying that <laughs> you knot. You figured that out. Yeah, <laughs> I reverse engineered it in advance. But yeah, and all of this, you know, how you catch a lobster. I, for me, I, I, I know this inside out. You put a salt mackerel. On, on the, you know, on, around the neck of the, of, that's a, uh, a parlor pot, um, and that's how you catch a lobster. Some of this stuff was, in the first edit, was very long-winded, and I always intended to cut it down. Yeah. But when actors came in, well, specifically Simon Shepard, who plays Tim, when he came in to do his voicing and saw the edit, he was just mesmerized by all this process of fishing. And I said, oh, yeah. this is all going to be cut down. He said, no, no, don't. Don't cut any of that down. Well, I also realized somebody pointed out to me that this is um, this scene's nicked out of yeah. With Nail and I. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love to see. I was so proud when I wrote that. And then um, somebody said, oh, yeah, you took that off with <laughs> um, We should say something as well about the music because um, uh, Gweno features in the background in one of the pub scenes, Yeah, um, which is a, a song which is, uh, it's the Bring Cheese song. Yeah, Is There Cheese? Is There Cheese? Yes, yeah. if, if, is There Cheese? If there is cheese, bring cheese. If there isn't, bring whatever's available, which I think is the translation. Yeah, roughly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, so uh, the rest of the music is stuff that you did yourself. Do you want to say something about the creation of the score? Yeah, well, I, I mean, there's songs that, like there's um, 
songs playing on the jukebox. So we have Thea Gilmore, The Malarkey, um, which is a great young band from Bristol. Uh, Gweno, I'm sure I've forgotten somebody. No. Um, even um, uh, Mary, um, my partner, her, her younger son, Morgan, yeah. he even um, programmed a song, which is the song that plays over the beach party. Oh, wow, OK. Um, so you are literally, ev everything in there is kind of, everything's got a personal connection. Yeah. And, when, and, I, and I, he made he made that piece of music and I listened to it and I thought, oh, that sounds great. I'll put it in the film. I didn't tell him. I put it in the film and then I said to him, oh, I've put your song uh, under a, uh, in the film. And he said, okay, let's watch, let's see it. So I played him the beach party sequence with his song and I yeah. thought he's going to be so stoked about this. And I said, what do you reckon? And he went, not loud enough. <laughs> And I said, I said, yeah, but you've got to be able to hear the dialogue. <laughs> he said, don't matter, it's not loud enough. <laughs> but my, um, yeah, the score was, I was actually... The score, which by the time this, 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 this is all finished, will actually have been released on vinyl? Yeah, yeah, so it's um, digitally and, and on vinyl by Invader, which is just, yeah, it's, that's one thing I re really, really didn't expect to get out of this film was my score released. <laughs> Publicly. And you said there's going to be a hit single in the charts. Yeah, like. I'm imagining it'll go to number one. <laughs> uh, the, the single, Ring Bolt Billy. Um, but it, yeah, I, I was very deep into the editing and I, I needed a distraction. I, all I was doing was working on the film. I was in the studio, it was winter, and I thought I just need something else creative to do that isn't the film. So I, so I chatted to Gweno, actually, and she was using this little... Um, K Korg, Volker, analog um, synthesizer, yeah. and they've, they're they're quite cheap. So I thought, oh, I'll treat myself. It's around Christmas time. I'll buy one and, and I'll start just playing a bit of music on it. Right on cue, there it is, um, and putting it through some delay pedals and echo and a reverb box and an old valve compressor and recording it to quarter inch tape and looping it and all this kind of stuff, mm. just as a distraction from the film. So when I wasn't working on the film, I'd go to the that. studio and just do that. Um, and then, but it was playing in the studio, and then I started editing the film, and it, sort of accidentally, it was laid over the top, and I thought, actually, this could work, because it, it was something about it that, that really worked for me. This is just incidentally, there's, um, I love that shot of Martin. Yeah. This scene here was the last thing we shot on location in Charlestown. If you see, it's absolutely pouring with rain. <laughs> um, this was shot a long time after the, all the other shots in this scene. And it was the one thing we had to get before we left. And we sort of had half a day and it was raining. And we thought we'd wait till the end of the day. And it just got heavier and heavier. And so that's, it was almost dark by the time we shot there. And, and Colin, who's, who, who lit it, ran this one blonde lamp right across the beach on a huge cable. And, and we just fired as much light as it as we could. And we all went away really despondent, thinking that's never going to work. But um, looks great. it did, yeah. Also, it's worth referring back to the pub scene that we saw before. There's a kind of frenetic editing happening in that, which is at a slightly different pace to the rest of the movie. And it was almost... It, it, it's, it's, it's a kind of... It, it's, there's almost a slapstick comedy element to the way in which you've cut that scene. Yeah, well, it, it was... A, it was um, no! Sorry, I'm just going to say yeah. one thing here. The, looking that way... The bloody street. Looking into the house, that's, yeah. a, that's a house down uh, near St. Ives. Looking the other way is Charlestown. That's a fake doorway he's stood in there. Wait, I just want to mention that because the art department who worked on a very limited budget created this amazing doorway for the quayside because there is no house actually next to the harbour yeah. there in Charlestown. And it's now got to the point where I can watch the film and I forget yeah, my I mean, suspension of disbelief. Until you is, said it, I never knew that it, that, 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 that it wasn't there. Yeah. Because no, it's, it's really convincingly done, really well done yeah it's um yeah i'm really really proud of of what they did there but it was it's yeah so shooting that way was at the yeah. beginning of the shoot and shooting this way was almost at the end of the shoot um and it's one of those things where you don't know whether whether it's whether it's going to work until you put the pictures together it always reminds me of um there's a there's a scene in in, in straw dogs in which somebody gets shot and they get shot up by Zena, and they land in Ealing. Right. <laughs> That's where, you know, it's a big yeah, gun. A big gun. <laughs> And that, the va the truck that plays Martin's truck there, that's Joe, who's the prop master's actual work truck. So that took a lot. Uh, you know, we, you couldn't create something in the art department that looks so much like a, a working truck, but yeah. it did. 
it did uh, hamper his work a little bit on the days <laughs> when he when he wasn't on location that he had to leave his vehicle with. Let it. me take you back to what you were saying about the editing of that that scene. I said it, that it, it's the the pace of the editing in that scene is very different to the rest of the film. Yeah. So the. And it's deliberately so because what's going on in that scene is you're getting a hell of a lot of exposition. So it's um, Liz, the character of Liz and Martin talking about um, Martin's older brother, Stephen, who we haven't really mentioned yet. Um, and it's all his backstory. So I, I knew the, the backstory had to be spoken about and... And, and said out loud the fact that yeah. he was a single parent, his wife had died, he was bringing his son up on his own, he had been fishing, but now he'd gone over to taking holiday makers out. But I, I wasn't happy with that just being a scene of somebody saying that. So um, the distraction is, the editing causes the distraction. So you're jumping around, not quite sure where you are, what's going on. But while all that's going on, you are yeah. getting, a getting a all of this information, information without yeah. knowing you're getting the information. Yeah. So it's basically a way of disguising the basil exposition moment. Yeah. Which is yeah, very yeah. well done. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And th this is a scene that was really created in the edit. Um, this was a nightmare on the shoot. We got, I, well, I take full responsibility for it. We got very behind schedule and we ran out of time. So this whole altercation in the doorway... Um, was just sorry. That's a, I can say that is a great line. It's between me and the clamping company. <laughs> <laughs> so I've seen some people that on Letterbox and stuff. Their their one line review. Quite often it is. It's between, between me, me and, and the clamping, clamping company. company. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't think that would be the line that where he took off. But, but sorry, you were saying. Um, yeah, this was something that was really pieced together in the edit. It. it Effectively, it's a fight scene, which I didn't storyboard or shot list. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, but that scene of the handcuffs going on, Yeah. tell me why that's... So that, that close-up of the handcuffs was supposed to introduce the next scene, which is where the character of Wenna, who's just about to throw the pool ball, gets arrested. Yeah. Um, in the script, it was always going to be a shot of handcuffs being put on, but when I cut it together, I much preferred cutting straight to a wide shot of the police car, which we'll see in a minute. Yeah. But because I didn't want to throw any of the film away, because I shoot so little and I hand process it all, I've become very attached to it. I always consider a bit of film that I've cut, I always consider it for another role within the film. And I, and I dropped it into this scene, which I couldn't cut together because I didn't have enough, cut, uh, enough footage. So by dropping in the handcuff shot, not only did it cover a lack of footage that I had for that scene, it also threw up this extra meaning, which that's, that yeah, shot... Yeah, she's shackled. Yeah, it becomes metaphorical if that's the, if that's the right word um uh, rather than it being a, a kind of literal and you said the same was true of some of the kind of flash forwards that it would be like you had, you had a piece of film that left over that you liked and it just found its way into the film which in the end ends up giving an impression of like nick rogue or you know that kind of uh, the, the, the that sh shifting the cards of time that he does but it's yeah. it's almost accidental the way it happens for you it is. I set up. I set up um, a trap for myself, really, where I, I don't shoot coverage. I don't shoot at all. No, I don't shoot big wide shots and then punch in for mid shots and close ups and extreme close ups. I read the script that I've written and I write down the shots that I see in the film as if the film's already been made. You know, there's no coverage in a final film. You can only you only see one shot at a time most of the time. So, and I just shoot the the shots that I can see. So then, when it comes to the edit, I realise that I haven't shot all the shots that I saw <laughs> and normally I'd, people would have coverage but I don't have coverage so a lot of the shots that um, the beginning and ends of roles that I've just captured become cutaways to cover my mistakes really but yeah. they're deliberate mistakes I set myself up in a way to, to, to sort of fall into that trap so that I can remake the film in the edit which I think is the most important version of the film because it's, it's the one that everybody sees this is a scene which has stuck with many audiences tell us about this this is a scene um, <laughs> that's based on true events oh really is that the way to say it yeah, yeah I mean and, uh, I think if you were going through the film this would be one of the most ridiculous scenes and the most caricatured perhaps but actually it's the closest to real life this is uh, somebody did lean out of a window and tell some fishermen that they shouldn't be making that much noise in the... <laughs> I think it's illegal yeah yeah <laughs> she's always the, the, that urban myth isn't it you can't make that much noise before eight o'clock right. there's a law oh, yeah, against go, it yeah, go and tell the bin men that go and, you know but again this is uh, I do love this scene because 
that's two completely different locations. So Morgan and Mary in this side are talking to two flagpoles in a picnic area. <laughs> and um, Ed and Isaac are on the quay. But he's looking at a chimney pot. That's his mark there. You know, they were never there at the same time. It's, well, it's really well done. But I think that, you know, it's, it's cinema. It, editing is just this incredible thing. Yeah. You put two shots together, you know, like like we've known for a long time you put two shots together and it creates something so amazing you said not caricaturing any of the any of the characters but that that one shot when he's walking away in his stripy pants with his you know tied up hair after having said I'm sure there's a law against it <laughs> that's as close as you get to outright and yeah. yet you know somebody did say on a podcast the other day that it the moment where he's in his pants with his man bun it's you can't argue where Jenkins' allegiance is, <laughs> I think, was yeah. the... But also, you know, I, 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 those char- I like those characters because even though they're the most outright, in some ways, sort of, not offensive, but they're the most kind of ignorant of the situation, I, I hope people, you know, I, I, I like to think they've got a backstory that they've been sold a lie like everybody else. Exactly. They've been sold a week's Airbnb or whatever it is. They've looked on the web. In lovely, relaxing Cornwall. Yeah, on a website that doesn't play sound. So you can't hear the fishermen when you look at the website page. You can't smell the fish guts when you look at it. All it is is pictures of people eating croissants on white (laughs) linen and drinking fresh orange juice and all this kind of stuff. And you don't know what stress they've got. They've got a little baby, which is going to put stress on anybody but they might have a really horrible stressful life and that's the one holiday they can afford in the in the year so i do hope it's not too um, i think if that's as i think if that's as far as you get in terms of the caricature it's perfectly justified and also because as you say that actually that scene is based on a truth and there is an underlying truth which is that they have been they've been told something that isn't true either that everyone's living in a place that they've been been told a different version of yeah 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 all across the whole across the whole of the community. There is a ridiculousness as well in the diving equipment, which is that, you know, and you you do see a lot of this around uh, Cornish beaches nowadays, Mm. very high-powered wetsuits. Yeah. But also, I I mean, I I, I saw, I do see people going out with spear guns and dry suits and stuff, and they come back with half a dozen bass. You well, go, oh, okay. actually, what well, they do know yeah, what they're doing. Do. But for him, it's much more the all the gear, no idea, where money isn't an object. So he said, um, oh, I could go spearfishing when I'm in Cornwall. And then Daddy's bought the, the top, top of the, the range, range gear, everything. Yeah. 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 Now, a while ago, you were talking about the sound and I interrupted you. So you film everything silent. You don't have any guide track. And you then edit lip reading the film yeah we do have a guide track just in case um a word changes in the delivery okay and i can't lip read it so you do record something on set that you then have as a reference point yeah but it's never listened to unless unless an actor says i really want to listen to the way i said it i don't like them to listen to it because i don't like them to be mimicking sonically i like them to be matching visually in the eyes of what they're you know the eyes of the character themselves yeah um so there is a there is a, a very low, rough, lo-fi, rough audio recording that's done, but not for all the scenes because some is just impractical to do it. But I, yeah, I'll do an edit based on um, on lip reading, um, and then adding in my voice to most of the characters to get the rhythm of scenes. So you do the first voice record for the film. Yes. So there is a version of the film in which you are doing all the voices. Yes. Yeah, which is uh, quite quite something, because <laughs> because they're because it's just the same voice. So it's not I'm not impersonating anybody. So it is a, de- a, a swift descent into madness when you watch it. It's sort of like uh, Eric Thompson doing Magic Roundabout. You, you're just doing everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you ever get wedded to that version of it? I mean, do you play the cast <laughs> your version and go, well, deliver the line like this, like the way I did it? Sometimes I, yeah. I, I have to admit, sometimes I think, oh, it'd be better if you just did it like I did it. Which, you know, I wouldn't say to sort of Chloe if she was coming in to do it, but, might. but then some, some of the secondary characters are voiced by other people because some people I couldn't get back to do the voices. Okay. So um, May, who who plays the the mother with the baby, who's also the production designer, also voices two other secondary characters 
the, uh, out of the youngsters. I was just going to say, this is Tristan Sturrock here, who um, is playing the cab driver, Brian, who was on a break from filming uh, Pole Dark. Um, and the car he's sat in is actually Martin Ellis, Nutty Noah, who plays the older fisherman. Yeah. That's actually his car, because um, life imitating art, when he gave up fishing, he went and became a cab driver, and that's actually his car yeah. with his phone number down the side and the flag of St Pyrrhon, the Cornish flag on the bonnet, which I don't think we quite see. But sadly, that car is no longer with us or no longer with Martin, so I'm very pleased that it's been uh, immortalised here. So you mentioned Pole Dark. Obviously, there, are, there there is filming that goes on in Cornwall, but um, the thing that I think everybody uh, commented on with bait is it feels authentically Cornish. How do you feel about the other stuff that's shot in Cornwall? I mean, you've kind of implied that you think that Cornwall has not been well represented on screen. Do you want to say something about that? I think it's often used as a background, and I think that's, that's fine. Um, it's fine to use anywhere for a background for other people's story as long as you acknowledge the background you acknowledge the context and you use it in an authentic way um, more often than not um, Cornwall and many rural areas in the UK and all over the world is used as a as a as a shortcut for by lazy writers for sort of a, a, a simplistic way of life or yeah. sim simple people, people who are less sophisticated than urban people. And I think, I think that's really damaging because you do, you do hear people if they, it, just people if they want to speak, if they want to sound stupid, they'll put on a sort of generic West Country accent. I mean, I don't even, I don't understand the idea of what the West Country is because I always think of it, Cornwall as being separate from everywhere else. So yeah. I think West Country stops at Plymouth. <laughs> but this idea that there's a West Country accent, which... I've never heard anybody in real life speak of it. It's sort of used as a kind of shortcut for being yeah. stupid. But And as my old mate um, Nick Dark always used to say, you know, Cornish people should be written in more complex, sophisticated ways. There are, you know, in, it's almost word for word what he said, that the Cornish people, there, there should be clever people, there should be stupid people, there should be funny people, like there is all over the world. And then... Um, yeah, I think that's much more interesting for an audience as much as anything. Do you want to say something about the guy dressed as the walking cock? <laughs> yeah, that's Callum Mitchell, um, who's the first assistant director, and much more than the first assistant director on the film, actually. You know, he's sort of my assistant who's always right there with me, and this film would never have got finished without him. But he was... Um, yeah, he, he, he wasn't first on the list to play that character. I did have somebody else in mind, but he, he stepped forward and... There he is. But I, I mean, is that something that you've actually seen? No, I just thought, what's the most ridiculous costume? And now, you know, with the internet, you can just get that ridiculous costume at, at the click of a switch. But the, the, one of, I mean, filmmaking is a ridiculous business anyway, but one of the most absurd things about Bait was me and Lynn, wait, when the producer stood on the quayside in Charlestown discussing whether. Callum could wear that costume next to the water because it was a health and safety issue. Because if he fell into the water... He would sink. Well, he, but because of the testicles, he would sink, he would, go, he would float, <laughs> but he would be upside up. down. So we were having a very straight-faced <laughs> conversation about whether inflatable testicles would mean that he was inverted in the water and whether he was allowed to... Oh, this bit here. I had a very interesting tweet about this the other day where, yeah. where he's calling Martin over and over again. And somebody sent me a message saying, can you settle a pub, an ongoing pub argument? Does that, does that scene reference the YouTube sensation of the guy whose dog has, had escaped in Richmond Park and was chasing the oh, deer? Oh, he was chasing, yes, Fenton. That's right, yeah. Fenton, Fenton, Fenton. And I said, yes, it is, that's where I got it from. Oh, wow. And this person on Twitter um, won themselves a, a meal in a bet because <laughs> she was insisting that it was uh, Weirdly, the thing reference. that it reminded me of was some... Um, the Ewan Bremner character in Naked shouting, is it Maggie? Oh, right. Yeah, no, it was, it's, it's Fenton. Good old Fenton. Good. And again, we're back in the pub that we're in is... The Bembo, yeah. So the, the pool room she just walked out of doesn't exist. That was a, another triumph for the art department working on a shoestring who put it up in an hour, which really saved us because the location didn't quite work in the way that I needed it to work geography-wise. This is a, this was always a huge, huge scene. Um, in early drafts of the script, this was much less of an argument, much more of a longer conversation scene, like the 
the scene in the middle of Land and Freedom where everything... Where yeah, when they have the big discussion, yeah, yeah. <laughs> where where the working the inner workings of everything that's going on in the film are suddenly exposed, but it, because all the dialogue's recorded afterwards, I try and lose as much dialogue as possible before we shoot. So I tried to cut this down and down and down to get to the drama, and the drama was just two people butting up against each yeah. other, which is why it's staged like it is. It's almost down the barrel and a, a very straight confrontation. And, I mean, it's interesting because I had actually imagined the first time I saw this that the scratches get more because because the, because of the tension in the room, but it, but that's not true. Uh, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe the uh, the hippie in me believes that the emulsion does react to the energy within the room. But, but it not, is interesting but that at the point that, this, that, that it becomes particularly heated, it yeah. almost looks like you've deliberately... Well, to be honest, it could be because I was having to change the role every two and a half minutes. Shooting a scene like this, I was having to change the role after each take, pretty much. Um, and I was probably doing it in a hurry, so it could, well, the energy and the speed that we're having to work at is physically manifest in the in the film. You mentioned before that you have a kinship with Andrew Cotting, of whom I'm a huge fan. Um, uh, and do you do you think there is something magical about the process of celluloid? Because one of the things with Andrew Cotting's films is that you can you can I've always said you can feel the the earth under your fingernails, you can feel the dirt in your feet. And there is something about shooting with celluloid because you had talked at one point about losing your love of cinema because you were working with video and then watching Mark Cousins' story of film. Do you want to say that? Yeah, I just... Um, I, th I always wanted to do as much as I possibly could on a film. I never... I, I, when I first started shooting film, I was shooting Super 8, so I, I would shoot a cartridge of film. I, it would just be me... I would edit in the camera. I'd be very careful of what I was filming. I'd send it off to the lab, um, and it would be processed and be sent back, and then I'd make a soundtrack for it. And, the whole, and I was excited by every single aspect of it equally. Then I started shooting stuff with mates on VHS video cameras when we were teenagers yeah. and that kind of stuff. And Again, we did everything, so we acted in each other's stuff, and I just loved everything about about the process and then as I moved on and started making films I suppose in a more professional way the crews got bigger and I got more separated from parts of the process that I really loved and then I made a film with a DSLR camera when they first came out and I thought this is great because I can shoot it I can just have a sound recorder, a couple of assistants and the actors and I can go back to doing everything but I just I didn't I just didn't get on with the camera and I just thought, ah, oh, I thought I'd purified it all and found this way of working, but then I didn't really, I didn't enjoy the process. So, because it distanced you from the process, because somehow I just think the the camera was making decisions. The computer in the camera, even if they were minor things, I didn't know how the camera worked, and it sort of drove me mad that I didn't know that somebody else had designed had designed the aesthetic, and I couldn't override it. I could have this choice or that choice, but I couldn't interfere with it in any way. And I think so. That's what I mean about the tactility, because I mean, obviously, I mean, you know, Andrew Cotting does use video, but there is a tactile feeling to his yeah. stuff, and that's it, isn't it? Well, I think it's an acknowledgement of the form as well. I think he, I like the filmmakers who don't try and hide the form. I, film is is a mechanical process. Without the form, you've just got verbal storytelling or a novel or maybe theatre with other, you know, if you bring other considerations into it. Mm -hmm. But for, I, I, I do get annoyed when people say, oh, you know, I was distracted by the editing or something. I can kind of understand that, but the film is the editing, yeah. you know? And, and I was talking to somebody earlier today about it, actually, the... The zoom, I love zoom lens. You know, I love a, a film where suddenly you get like a 1970s... Crash zoom. Crash zoom, but that slightly has to reframe <laughs> at the end because it's not yeah. been done automated. It goes bang, doesn't quite hit it, and then it moves. Because <laughs> I love that because I just suddenly think, oh, my God, this uh, subconsciously probably, I just go, oh, it's somebody behind the camera. Mm -hmm. And then I just go, oh, that's really... Yeah. It's not, not necessarily to do a horror or unsettling or anything like that, but just this sense that there's a... Me some mechanics going on. I mean, from my point of view, from the you know, from the viewer's point of view, what I got out of it was, um, I mean, quite apart from that, I you know, I love film and and I I love the aesthetic of film, but I think because so much of the story is about two ties, about the past and the present, and I think that what you've done therefore is that you're using uh, you know clockwork cameras, black and white film, which is an a, a, you know an, an ancient form which is still with us now, but the story is very very contemporary, and therefore in the form and narrative completely joined in that they are about 
that pull between past and present. This is a, again, this is you know the, the way in which you've cut this scene. Do you want to say something about the editing of this because this is very very be- this is beautifully edited. Yeah, I mean this would, again this I didn't quite know how I was going to do this scene, but when I wrote it, I was absolutely sure that I didn't know how I was going to do it, and I wouldn't know until the edit. So it was. Re- it's it's a Western inflection, isn't it? It's he, it's he, he walks into the bar. Yeah. and. This is the standoff. Yeah. And this is a good example of where I don't shoot any coverage. So the bit where he walks up through the pub, um, he comes to the door, and then the next time you see him, he stood in front of the character of Hugo. And I decided on the day that I wouldn't shoot a shot of him walking because I like the idea of him just suddenly, what we refer to on the day as Nosferatuing, up to <laughs> in front of Hugo. And that's how I first cut it. But it was too funny it was it was a moment of humor when it was supposed to be very tense okay so but i didn't have any coverage but what i had got at the end of each role was i'd got the characters to say right sort of somebody like lewis who was just there like lewis look at that post and then look over to that post so i had all of these head turn shots i didn't know what i was going to do with them <laughs> but then i so the shot where martin walks from the door up to hugo is just the sound of footsteps and people's heads turn head turning which is a sort of western you know reaction yeah, shots yeah. and the menace is in the silence and the lack of emotion um and yeah and so the, the montage was built up silently obviously and this is one of the scenes where i didn't add a lot back in just a lot of uh, foley, which was done by Dan Thompson, who did um, a lot of the foley and the, and the sound design. Um, and so the tensions in in the cuts, you know, the shots on their own. There's no menace in any any of these shots, really. But once you cut them together, you get this sense of unease. But it's also, I mean, it's a beautiful payoff that you know, you've, when he pulls the knife out, you think that it's going to go one way, and then what he's actually doing is showing him out of it, and then it, it's fixing it. Yeah. Yeah, make 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 it right. Make it right. Yeah. And he gives him the chance to make it right. I, I like this this character, you know, he Jake there has got such a good face. Um yeah, and he yeah, he gives him the chance to make it right. And when he does make it right, he takes the opportunity to make it right. He hasn't got a lot of choice, but <laughs> he could have legged it. But he does make it right and he thanks him for it. And and that's trying to set up the tragedy that at that point he thinks everything's okay. He's yeah. sort of he he's the big alpha male in the community. He's made it all right, and then he goes around to all the other characters to tell them everything's fine now. But little does he know, it, it's not. What about the close-ups of the you know of the fork going into the flesh and taking it out of? It? I mean, it's it it does make it seem particularly. There's something very there's something nasty about that shot. Right? Yeah, I don't know. Um, it, do you think nasty, would would it look nasty in isolation or is it in the context? I think it's within this? the context because obviously it's cutting between this kind of you know this 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 very refined meal and something else which is happening else. When there's something about the image of the, I mean, it's like the innocent flesh being taken out or something. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm glad you got that. No, I think what I wanted to do was contrast the the, the two meals. So the sort of older, sophisticated meal than the young people cooking a meal for themselves. Um, but before that, we'd seen the lobster alive. Yeah. And so you know, it, there is there is a sacrificial thing going on in there. I mean, I you know, I eat lobster, I eat fish, you know. So I mean, it's not a. But there is something in the narrative of the film which is about something being sacrificed. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And in and in, in, in the sort of the ruins of the. Farm fire and the and the lobster carapace in the in yeah. in the flames yeah this this is um always an interesting bit for me the all these um figureheads in the pub which i never noticed when we wrecked it i never intended to shoot them but i, I just quickly got cutaways at the beginning and end of each roll of film bits of film that i didn't think i was going to be able to use and then it turned out every character in the scene has got a, a, do, a, goppel, a doppelganger okay. um and some of them are really really freaky but again you know i didn't intend that it's not in the script but but i can reverse engineer meaning and say well again you know all these characters are tight that these the, all these archetypes are already in the pub they're already represented and yeah. memorialized in these figureheads so there is also a sense there of fate at work yeah well and i think if you do if you use any kind of flash forwards i think you're alluding to fate i think you know you mentioned don't look now earlier um the, that moment in don't look now where Donald Sutherland's character witnesses his own funeral. Yeah. And I remember seeing that for the first time and I thought, what was that? And then 
about five minutes later went, oh my God, mm -hmm. when I'd suddenly worked down my head and absolutely chilling. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I love the idea of that fake. Because, I mean, cinema effectively is a past tense medium. Everything's gone when you see it. And so I, I like the idea of being able to jump forward into a time that shouldn't exist, yeah. but you can hint at it. And it's not to do... I mean, don't it now is to do with clairvoyance, obviously, but um, an extrasensory perception. This isn't necessarily that, because although I do at times have a character in close-up turn around and their point of view, they see something else, you know, yeah. they never acknowledge it, so it's not like they're necessarily experiencing it. But I do... Uh, yeah, that kind of collage um, I find really unsettling. So you mentioned Rogue, and we talked a little bit about Andrew Cotting. And I mean, I, I, I wasn't the only person in reviews to, to you know, mention Grierson. Who else do you think of as sort of influential for you? Um, Bresson, for me. Um, not, not directly, but just, I know, I think Scorsese's got the... The, the mantra, you know, what what would Bresson do yeah. when he's stuck? Because it's you you can get in such a mess when you're making a film. It can be so complicated because you've got all these different elements, and you can get so far, you can get so tangled up. And actually, to to think, what would Bresson what do? What Bresson do? Yeah, he would do it very simply. But he would. But then, you know, Bresson would hate a scene like this. You know this kind of cross cutting and yeah. um, a sort of and that the sound design and or, but even when I'm trying to create something where there's sl something slightly uncanny going on here is 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 a bit unnerving because she's gone into his house yeah. she's up on the estate the weather seems to have changed the season's yeah. gone from summer to autumn at that point I think he's he's down with his dad yeah. who may or may not be real so I th there's quite a lot going on there which which is quite complicated and can only be created in the edit but also you know uh, yeah. if i'm getting very mixed up i will think how can i simplify this is always a always a process of simplification this scene's shot in um newlin then the, uh, um a place called skilly where i go a lot um so the daytime gully stuff is Charlestown, but the nighttime yeah. stuff is is Newlyn. There's also a nice ambiguity in when you see the counting the money. Is, is the money coming out or going? I know it's going mm. in, but there is a moment when you're not entirely sure what what's happening with that money. Is she yeah. stealing from him? Yeah, exactly. And I loved that because, um, and I only noticed that afterwards. But I thought that's quite nice actually because you could say they are taking and not giving, yeah. but actually the reality is she's giving money to sort of ease her conscious, yeah. Co uh, yeah, her conscience. But um, but yeah, you could read it as taking. Yeah. When we first talked about your processing, you told me um, about processing the the film with the films with instant coffee. Now I know you didn't do that with with this, but do you want to? You you are very involved in the chemical process of them. How did the instant coffee thing work? Um, that came from. I mean, it's pretty, it's a, quite a tried and tested process. Um, it was it, it's like an eco process really because you can pour. You know, you pour it away down the sink once you've used it, which you can actually with black and white photographic. Okay. Um, but you didn't chemicals. discover that till later on. I didn't. No, I wanted to do something, and I think I also wanted to do something, not gimmicky, but I wanted to do something that was a bit more um, experimental. Yeah. You know, I, I, I was. It was when I was making Bronco's House, so I wanted it to be. I knew it was a narrative film, but I, I wanted to be able to say, oh, it's an experimental film as well. And that might have been me worrying that it wasn't going to succeed as a narrative <laughs> film. So I was like, oh, no, oh, it's experimental. <laughs> I, did it in, I did it in coffee. And that's why it doesn't make sense. You know, it's experimental. Um, and it's great. It's a brilliant process. It's very cheap because you now with Poundland, you can buy huge amounts of coffee for <laughs> virtually no money. Um, vitamin C powder is the key ingredient which is the most expensive bit but because of sort of alternative um treatments you can get these big tubs of non-food grade vitamin c powder very cheaply yeah. now and it's great i th should say about the Stephen here who's on the boat is um martin's older brother in the film that's uh, an actor called giles king who's actually isaac who plays his son in the film? That's actually his his dad, yeah. and I mean it's the one, it's one of the actors we haven't talked about yet. I think his performance, although he's he's not in it a huge amount. No, but he's a very important character. He's very important, and he's very. Um, it was a very tricky role to play, I think, and uh, I just think it's a staggering performance. Really. Tricky because it's it, it's the le the less sympathetic of the two brothers. 
I, I just think he's got less time to do what he needs to do. So each of his each of his scenes, is, he, he's doing something slightly different. And he's one of the characters, um, one of the actors that it wasn't until I got into the edit, I thought, oh, he's doing that there. And thank God he is doing that because that's now making that yeah. scene work. When I was with Ed, I always knew what Ed was doing. We chatted about it all the time. We'd spent a huge amount of time together doing the post sync in the dialogue because he's got so much dialogue. So I, me and Ed were always sort of in sync. But with Giles, I didn't speak to him as much. But he, and he's very experienced, very experienced theatre actor, and has also done um, films as well. Yeah. Um, and it, it was this, some of the subtle stuff and some of the stillness that when I saw, when I processed the footage and saw it back, I suddenly realised what he'd been doing. Georgia Ellery is another person who I didn't, I can't claim to have understood everything she was doing yeah. or, or take responsibility for all the great stuff she was doing until I saw it in the edit. One of the things I think is really, I mean, I love the film and I think it's, you know, I think it, it, it's one of the defining British films of the decade. But one of the things that I think is really impressive about it is it's one thing for, you know, a critic to look at it and go, well, I, you know, I love the aesthetic and I love this, that and the other. But it's the fact that audiences have re reacted emotionally. They haven't reacted, um, you know, yes, you can discuss the, the, the aesthetic, but people, it, has, it has worked with people emotionally. Did you know that that was always going to be the case? No, because I think I was so tied up in the specificity of it. And early on, I thought I was making a film about such a specific part of Cornwall that other people in other parts of Cornwall wouldn't even understand. So to, to see that universally it has got an appeal thematically... That, well, that's really great. But what I find really exciting is that it's in a film that's got an unusual cinematic form yeah. and that people are obviously, you know, I can't claim to say they're hungry for it, but they're obviously accepting... Embracing of difference. It. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And, and I, I mean, I get bored of a lot of film, the way that it's made... The, for, the way the form is used. So it's, it's really invigorated me, thinking, oh, there is this hunger for... For, or the, uh, sort of, you know, people yeah, are embracing yeah. something that's different well, and talk, also in the theatre. Talk me through this now because obviously we're coming towards a, good, a fairly major point. Yeah, and this, again, this was something that is effectively a fight sequence that should have been very carefully planned, but on the day the plans went out the window and when we walked away from this um, shoot, this shooting day, I really thought we didn't have this scene and I cut and cut and recut and recut this scene. That's the key shot which we had one go at, really. And that was it? Yeah. Well, we did two, but I knew that Isaac, who's, who fell, I knew that when he could fall down, he, I mean, he, to give away the secret of how he did it, he dropped into the gap between the boat and the harbour wall, and there's actually quite a big gap there, and the, and the distance is compressed via the long lens. But um, I knew that once he'd fallen off the wall onto his back into the water, which is entirely safe and didn't hurt him in any way, um... I knew that he wouldn't be able to do that again. Something would kick in, and actually, the second take, he just drops like a pencil. Right. Something kicks in, says, "Don't, don't fall on your back." Again. <laughs> <laughs> he might not be. Uh, it might hurt next time. So you thought you didn't have it? Yeah, I didn't. But I didn't think I had the film when we finished. I remember. I remember at the rap party. Um, which I DJ'd at for the whole night so I could just be on my own. So I played records and everybody else had a party. I remember thinking then, and I have this all the time, the self-doubt, you go, because what you shoot isn't what you imagine you're going to shoot. Yeah. And actually, that's great. But when you've just got to the end of that process, you think, that's, and we haven't got a film. And I always think, there's a point in the shoot where I think, this isn't going to work, but I'll carry on because I can get some kind of abstract gallery installation out of the footage we're going to capture, <laughs> at the very least. And so... So not the defining British film of the decade, but some abstract gallery installation. Yeah, it's either one or the other. It's never somewhere in the middle. But then... But, but, and I should know, I never learn. I'll have that in the next film. It'll be halfway through it, and I think I'll be start thinking about which gallery I can pitch it to. But it's made in the edit, and that's... I don't mean to... I don't mean to undermine everybody's um, input because there's, there would be nothing to do in the edit unless everybody is contributing and everybody's at the top of their game and everybody's focused and everybody buys into the vision. Yeah. But a pile of unprocessed film isn't a film. Um, 
it, it's an installation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe that should be my installation. I don't even process it. It's just the cans <laughs> in the corner of the gallery with some kind of justification. But, you know, and I, I, I am very wary that it makes it sound like because I do the edit myself, I'm taking credit for everything. Like I say, ev all the elements have got to be there and you cannot, you cannot make a film out of nothing in the edit. Yeah. But you can certainly screw the film up in the edit or miss the point of it. And actually, it, during the edit, I, I kept thinking, it's not quite there, it's not quite there. It was really, it was really like chipping away at a bit of marble, this film. When did you know that it was a, the, the film played, it, it was the, the Berlin Alley was the first yeah. public screening? Yeah. What was that like? Um, crazy. I mean, I'm, I'm so glad I went there with no expectations. And no shoes. No, I did have shoes. Yeah, I did have shoes. <laughs> you have done interviews without shoes, Mark. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't. I tend not to wear shoes through the summer, but it was February, so okay. I did. Um, yeah, I was. I was shod. Um, it, yeah, it was in a huge theatre, six hundred and sixty seats. I think it was sold out. Um, I I wasn't expecting to sit in and watch the film, but they reserved a row for all of us, so there was a few of us there. Um, and it was just a crazy experience, and it hasn't really stopped since then. But, yeah, like I say, I, I'm, I'm kind of glad that I didn't have any expectations. I was expecting to go there, a few good audiences, and then, you know, on to the next thing. Um, so how do you do... I mean, the, you know, the fact is the critical response has been extraordinary. People have absolutely loved it. it you know, five-star reviews everywhere. It's had this huge emotional impact with audiences. At the time that we're talking, I think it's taken something like £400,000 uh, in the UK, mm. which, which is an astonishing figure. Um, yeah, how, do, how does it feel? Um, it, well, it feels great. <laughs> <laughs> but... I, but you know it takes so long to make a film so i'm i'm well into making the next one not that i've picked up a camera yet but you know the 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 script's been drafted and and redrafted so i'm now i'm trying not to think too much about this film in regard to the next film because there's a danger that i could try and repeat what i've done here yeah. and the success of this film isn't all down to the film you know, there's a lot of timing involved in this. It's hit, it's hit an, a raw nerve, I think, in this country and in other countries in terms of the subject matter it's addressing. But and also, it was it was picked up by the BFI. Now, the BFI might not have seen it. it we might have gone with another distributor, and the story might be completely different. So, yeah. trying to repeat, you know, the ori original review from Peter Bradshaw might have. You know, he might not have watched the screener that he watched. He might have, you know, his phone might have rang when he was just about to put the disc in his laptop or however he watched it. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of chance involved. I think you've got to have a, a good film, good in inverted commas, whatever that means, but something at the heart of it. But there's so much other stuff that's just left to chance that um, it's, a, it's very dangerous to try and repeat that. And I think it's a mistake people make um, through all art forms, I think, is to try and repeat something. And I think certainly it, trying to kind of develop a, a formula that you can repeat is, is very dangerous. So I'm trying to do something very different. So the next thing you do, will it be, will it be film or...? Yeah, it's... Uh, I'm actually... <laughs> having said I'm not going to repeat myself, it's going to be shot exactly the same way. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's going to be colour. So it will be lab processed, it'll be colour, but it'll be shot on the Bolex, it'll be post-synced. It's a film with very little dialogue. It's a, it's a horror film called um, Ennis Men. Its commentary might date very badly if that film doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> now tell us about this, because obviously this is kind of, you know, confrontation moment, so tell us what, what's happening. Well, originally, in early drafts of the script, this was a, a shotgun rampage. He comes down onto the key of a shotgun and there's a charity raft race going on in the harbour and he just starts blowing people away. Um... Which was, wow! Which I was have a, no idea. Which was a very different ending in in terms of budget and and also in terms of the story. So um, it, we rewrote it. Um, well, I rewrote it based on some conversations with me and Kate and and Lynn about a, a more a subtler, simpler ending where there was a sense of redemption because obviously 
if Steve, if the character Stephen had gone on a shotgun rampage, he was he was either going to be yes. in prison for the rest of his life or he'd yeah. end up I, dead. I, I confess, Mark, I can't imagine that ending. No, I mean, lots of the rest of the film was very different to justify, to yeah. build up to that ending. Sure. It, wouldn't, it wouldn't have come out of nowhere. But, but it was making it more domestic and bringing it down to this idea that actually... The character of Stephen, his sort of distance through the film is is a form of grieving that we that that Martin can't see and and actually the audience probably don't see in, until this point where he does um where he does sort of snap and he does it in a very uh, the, he does it the, the, with um with his focus on the humorous element of their house which is the the much derided porthole um. Which it, you know, which is very rogue, incidentally. Which bit the uh, the, the glass, the gla- and the glass yeah. shattering, and, yeah. the, and the bottle through. Yeah, and the big, particularly since we've had the kind of past and present shuffling before that, yeah. it's very much a kind of. They knock mother's pantry down. And then that's the line, which which I always, which I did wonder whether people would find funny, whether this whole sequence has kind of got some humour in it, you know, and as as the dad kind of moves away and leaves leaves room for his son to take responsibility I, I think it has real pathos and tragedy I think yeah. it's really and I've in fact I haven't seen a screening when that line has got a laugh no no it, but it was in, I, I was worried it was but very you know in the very first screening in Berlin people were there was there was tears at, the, at this moment so that was it is beautifully done and it is the understatement of it that makes it work yeah and ultimately it comes to you know it's two it's two big hairy blokes who are both a bit lost really um, and I think that's, that is quite. That's, that, there is some poignancy in that, yeah. especially those, those those types of characters. And th- this scene, which we keep coming back to, so this is the third time we've seen this scene. This was um, just to say, I, I was laid on the on the roof of a Nissan Micra that was freewheeling <laughs> down a down a gentle slope with with Maria, who was. Uh, um, on the crew, just sat in the driver's seat, applying her foot gently to the brake to make sure we didn't end up in the harbour. Because <laughs> I, I really love that shot, and it, it's sort of it, that was the bit that I wanted to be this sort of iconic image. And um, but if you see the behind-the-scenes footage of how we did it, it's absurd. But again, it's there is that Western inflection to it, and I'm you know I know this is, it's a crass thing, but you know. We've talked, you and I have talked about straw dogs before. We all know what's what's good and what's ba- bad about straw dogs. But the West Country Western thing, there is a Western motif that runs through this, isn't yeah. there? Yeah. Well, it is. You know, and it's a frontier. It's almost yeah. like it's a frontier story. But it's also a, the, the, they are these are they are literally heading out into the wilderness at yeah. the moment. And as that that informs character and that informs community. You know, they go out through the safety of those gaps there, and that they're into the unknown. Yeah. And I think that's really powerful, and that, that's what I love about this. I, what I love about these communities and, and, and this way of life. And it's hard, you know, people are they're tough people, and there's no, there's not a lot of airs about them, you know, simple airs, as they say. And it's, uh, yeah, it, it's very easy to make it like a, feel like a Western. I think it has a kind of mythical, archetypal feel, which I think, you know, is something we definitely get from Westerns. But I also think, and, you know, I think I'm not the only person who've said that it feels authentic, it feels genuine, it doesn't feel um, forced or artificial for all the artistry and the, um, and the you know, the, the technique involved. It never feels anything other than authentic, which I think is one of the reasons why it works so emotionally. I mean, weirdly enough that all manifests itself as an emotional mm. punch. You watch the film and you, you get emotionally lost in it. Well, I mean, in terms of the form, you know, it's not... I, the one thing I definitely know is me working this way. It's not a, it's not a, a gesture, you know, this... It's an ethos. I, yeah, I... This is the type of filmmaking I love. I, I say it all the time. This is... I go to bed on a Sunday night excited to wake up on Monday morning to pick up a camera and to shoot 16 millimeter film and to process it if nobody was watching it I'd still be I'd still be making it so it's not a, a you know it's not an affectation but I think the, the authenticity is the most important thing to me going back to what we were saying about being nervous at that Newlyn screen and the reason I was nervous because when we were chatting I was seeing people from the community coming in mm-hmm. and like I said I can't control people, whether people like the film or not but but 
if it's not authentic, it's not authentic. Yeah. That's a great, it's a really great phrase. We Do argued a lot about what the last film was going to... Well, not argued a lot, but we tried different things. But that shot of the character of Neil stood on the beach, yeah. which is from a completely different, totally different scene. Originally, they were going to look back and see the, gra to see the granddad. Right, right. And Neil, both on the key, which I put at the beginning of the film. Yeah. And I, was, I didn't quite know what, what was wrong with it until I showed it to Simon Harvey, who I mentioned earlier, who said, he said it was like... Um, Return the Jedi. <laughs> so just as the credits roll, if you see, um, is there, if, you, if there's anything you want to pick out that you think you may have overlooked during the during the uh, the commentary. Yeah, I realised I didn't mention Janet Thurloway, who plays Mrs. Peters, who's um, who's the the lady who lives next door up on the estate, who's sort of the all-seeing eye. Yeah. And actually, she's called Mrs. Peters because there's the St. Ives artist Alfred Wallace, who I'm making also making a film about. His neighbour was Mrs. Peters, so I'm thinking it was ba based on her, the idea of the, the, the caring next-door neighbour. Let's have a look if anybody else there I've forgotten on the, um, on the credits. Um... And just so while well, this rolls, the first time you and I met was because in what's now the Newlyn Cinema, which used to be a fish processing plant, and there was a there was a gallery installation there, and me and Tom, who's an artist, had played there during a power cut, and you took a photograph of us, which you then produced with you developed with coffee, and that was the first time you and I kind of came into contact. Yeah, I just found this roll of film that I'd taken during that exhibition yeah and there was I think there was two photos of you and one of them just was I, I I was kind of crouched down quite low in front of you looking up into the corner of the um it was an old smokehouse that's right yeah and it was this and I think it was actually you were playing in the in the ice shoot what used to be the ice shoot behind and, so and I thought right. you know when you were playing your it's you an old dobro your, guitar and yeah, sitting on the crater thing, yeah, yeah yeah looking like sun house and I thought <laughs> <laughs> and I thought there, you know, it looked like you were in the back of a box car. Yeah. So I printed it and I tinted it using coffee to get a sepia tint. And that, yeah, and luckily you. Um, it yeah, looked great. It, 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 it ended up into the final picture in a book that I wrote about being in band. Yeah. So I'm just immensely there we grateful. Go. Morgan Ansel, Jeff Jeff Hold. So that's Mary's son. There we go. But not loud enough. Not loud enough. Not loud enough. I said, why is it called Jeff Jeff Hold at the time? He said, oh, I can't tell you. And then a little while ago, I said, can you tell why is it called Jeff Jeff Holden? He said, oh, I don't know, I just made it up. <laughs> and that's ESK's meaning, is there cheese? Yes, that's right, yeah. Um, excerpt from the Cinematologist podcast, which plays in the background of a one scene. Very, very fine uh, podcast. If you haven't subscribed to it already, then please do. <laughs> it's, it's a terrific thing. And then, of course, the connection with uh, with Falmouth, uh, you know, the, the, the School of Falmouth, which, which is so important because many of the people that worked on, on the film... We had yeah, grad we had some graduates on the film. So Dan um, Dan Thompson, who who worked on the sound with me, um, was somebody I mentored in for their third year project at the university when I was doing a bit sort of a, um, uh, associate lecturing there, and um, we stayed in contact. And he he worked on um, Bronco's House and then came That's and great. and did bait and yeah several others so Laura Hardman was the um, produ a very good friend of mine who was producing an earlier incarnation of bait who um, who passed away very suddenly um, several years ago um, she was a, a huge part of getting this film made and there's the um, to Nick Dark. yeah the dedication to Nick which um, that that won't be on the end of all of my films, but take it as read that that applies to everything I do. Mark, congratulations on the film. I think it's a genuine work of art, and uh, you know, congratulations and thanks for joining us for this commentary, which was lovely. And I I hope the film goes on to f continue to find audiences who have the emotional reaction to it that I think we all have had. Thanks, Mark, and thank you very much for your support.